this evening and uh, just for the simplicity of music, Lord, and the ability that it has to do what little else has, to, to just get our thoughts off of ourself and on to you. But now, Lord, as we turn our, our minds from worship to the study of your word, once again, we confess our dependency upon you to reveal to us what it is you want us to see. Um, we don't want to come away from here knowing a whole bunch of more facts. We want to come away from here this evening knowing more, not just about who you are, but, but knowing you at a deeper level. And so, Lord, be honored and glorified in all that we say and do here this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we take, took a look at this, and uh, this is really kind of the verse what we uh, concluded on last week, which kind of points us in the direction of the idea of the, the triune nature of man. And this is, of course, Paul writing uh, in his first letter to the church of Thessalonica uh, in the fifth chapter, and he's closing the book out here. Um, and of course, we, we talked about this, and boy, it'd be awful fun to, to delve into this and explain why he actually said this verse, but, or wrote this verse, I should say, but we don't have time to get into that. But this is what he says very simply here. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. That set you apart. Okay, sanctify, that's what it means. And may your whole spirit, and there's the first word that we looked at or we, we touched on. We're going to delve into it a little bit more here this evening. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is where this concept comes in of the, well, it's not just the only place, but this is one of the key phrases um, in the New Testament where it identifies this. Um, and he's using three very distinct words here, and he's asking for in each aspect of the spirit, soul, and the body, he's praying that God would set those things apart unto him, himself, so that we would be found blameless when the Lord returns. And so this is where we get this idea that being in the image and the likeness of our God, of our Creator, this is why we need to understand this concept of us as a triune being um, in our nature as well. So we're going to take a journey through this, and we're going to look at all of this. Now, we saw this briefly last week, but here you've got the whole spirit, soul, and body thing, this triune nature of man. This is what it means to be in God's image and, of course, in his likeness. But specifically there it says, in the image of God, he created them, right? And so that's what we're really kind of looking at here tonight. So let's take a closer look at this concept of the spirit, okay? Now, in Romans chapter 8, in verse 16, Paul here identifies the idea that whatever the spirit is, the spirit of man, it's that part of us which identifies us in our relationship to who he is, okay? And that's what Romans chapter 8 is all about. Um, when you begin in chapter 8, uh, you get this, the, the, this, this whole idea now of, of, of the Spirit of God at work within the life of the believer, which to this point Paul has talked about, right? And he's explained the whole idea uh, that sin has created a big problem, but then there's sanctification, and then he's moved into this area now to where we live in our relationship with God, and it's on a spiritual level. Now, obviously, there are physical things that are involved in that, our, our prayer, our study of his word, our fellowship, all of these other things with one another, but in particular with him. And so when you get to verse 16 of chapter 8 here, it says here, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. This is what, how we know within the core of our being that we are children of God. It's not because we raised our hand or we went forward at some uh, some study, not that there's anything wrong with those, but the point of what Paul is trying to make here is if you're a child of God, you're going to know it within you because there's going to be a witness within you that, yes, I am a child of God. And this is a really important thing. Now, notice what he's done here. He's used the word twice, and it is the same word, but notice that the first time it's capitalized that's because it's speaking about the Holy Spirit, 
Okay? In the Old Testament, the Ruach HaChodesh. That's how they'd say Holy Spirit. But that's who's being identified with the first spirit here, and that's why it's capitalized. And then our spirit, notice, it's not capitalized. Because from God's perspective, uh, unlike what we think of ourselves, we're really not that much, we're not that important. And so we get a small s, and he gets the big s, okay? But that's what's being identified here. And Paul is clearly telling us that the work of the Spirit of God in us is to assure us about our relationship with who he is, all right? That's what we're talking about here. Now, when you look at the word spirit, and you see it in the New Testament, the word that we see in our English language is the translation of the Greek pneuma, okay? And it literally means, if you take all of the other stuff away and, you know, what it, the nuances of the word and all that, what it literally means is breath or wind, okay? That's what it means. Now, I know I've said this before, so bear with me for those of you that have heard this. Um, the idea of pneuma, we carry this in, uh, right up to the, the current days. If a person has a problem with their breathing and their lungs are filling with fluid or they have COPD or they have whatever the case may be, they have a problem. We, and, and especially if there's just fluid in the lungs, we call that pneumonia because it's related to breath and wind. That's what the word means. For guys in here, well, and for even for some ladies, when we use air tools on a car, when I was mechanic for Chevrolet and, you know, whatever, working on the car, we had a, what we called an impact wrench, but it was an air wrench. It was a, it was a ratchet or a, or a, you know, a half-inch gun, whatever the case may be, that was ran by air. It's an air tool. And so those things were called pneumatic tools because it had to do with air. It had to do with wind and all this stuff. So you get the idea. Now, as the, the wind, uh, the idea of the spirit, which, by the way, is, is the Greek translation of the Hebrew ruach, okay? That's spirit in the Old Testament. <clears throat> and that it's, it's ach, it's that one, you know, it tastes like you got a furball <laughs> kind of thing. Um, and... But the concept of it, because it was breath, because it had to do with life, remember God breathes into his life, right? And he becomes then in a flesh, but, but the, he's breathing, there's air. So it took on a broader meaning because when God breathes, there's life. And so it became known as, um, in the Hebrew, as they define it, and even parts of, the, as the Greek defines it, it's the immortal principle, the source of life, to the body and the soul. It's the faculty of intelligence, understanding, thinking, reasoning, and feeling in relation to God. That's exactly what Paul says. Okay? It's that part of us that assures us of our relationship with God. We don't have to live in fear uh, that, that we may not have the relationship that we, you know, that we thought we had with God. If we have God's Spirit in us, it's going to be a no-brainer. There's no way to describe it. If you've experienced this, and I pray that everyone in here has, if you have experienced this, then you know what I'm talking about. And you know that, that God's Spirit is bearing with us, that you belong to Him even when you're being a turd. Oops. Well, that just went out all over the web, didn't it? Even when you're being rotten. Let me clarify that. You didn't really hear that first word. <laughs> Dang. That's really bad when you're being recorded and sent all over the world. That's not a good thing. But anyway, you get the idea, okay? Because God's Spirit, He understands our spirit. Remember, the Spirit is willing, but the flesh, not so much. Okay, so, so this idea, this is how we know about our relationship with Him. Okay, that's the idea of the Spirit. So the Spirit is that part of us which has that ability to communicate in the vertical or the spiritual realm. And this is where we as believers find ourselves oftentimes being that T word we just talked about because what we do is we have this, this incredible tendency to disregard the vertical and focus on the horizontal. 
We're affected by everything that comes at us, okay? Especially last night, right? We still don't know what the crud is going on with all of that. And it's just bummed a bunch of us out. Why? It's irritating, make no mistake about it. But you know what? It don't matter who sits in the White House. My king is still on the throne. It's just the way it is. And if it goes this way, it's because he chose to allow it to go this way. So who am I to argue with it? Does that mean I like it? Heck no. But you get the idea. So, so the spirit functions within the spiritual. But we have this, this, just, this audacity to just constantly focus on the horizontal. And that's where our problem lies. If we would deal with and get that vertical relationship, the us and him dealt with, the horizontal would naturally take care of itself. It just would. Because then things are in the right perspective. Instead of focusing on the horizontal, we focus on the vertical, then things go a lot better. They just do. I mean, it's, it's, it's not rocket science. We all understand this. Okay, And then the last thing here, it's the spirit, the part of us that makes us alive in our relationship to God and is the source of our commune with him. Paul just said it. It's his spirit communicating with our spirit. Okay, This is how God has chosen to do it. He communicates us with, on that level. Now we're going to see how this all plays out because obviously it doesn't stop there. There's, got to, there's some decisions that got to be made, uh, some choices that have to be made, and whether or not you're going to receive this or not. This, these things will all play out as we go. But it's that part of us that makes us alive in relation to God, just like Adam. Adam was nothing. He was nothing but a shaped, formed, um, fashioned, physical body. And had God not breathed life into him, he would have remained as such. But he didn't remain that way because God breathed life. So the source of God at work in us is the Spirit. We're going to see the contrast to that tonight. Well, I don't know if we'll get to it tonight. I hope so. But we'll see how it goes. Okay? So fellowship between God and man by God's design. So this is how it works. This is how it's supposed to be. Okay? Because there we understand, once again, we see this in the same structure, so the spirit, soul, and body, that's us, okay? Because we're in the image and likeness of God, it would be Father, Son, Holy Spirit, okay? But you get the idea. Actually, Father, uh, uh, Father uh, you get the idea. And then, of course, there's God. Well, what God does to us, based on what Paul just said and multitudes of other passages in the New Testament, well, as the old as well, is that God communicates to our spirit, Okay? This is why the person who doesn't have a relationship with God, the things of God are foolishness to him. Because there's no, there's no spirit to reveal to him that what he's hearing or experiencing is actually truth. So this is how God works. So God is in relationship with our spirit. That's our communication aspect, what just Paul talked about. But that relationship right there will have a direct effect or the lack thereof, uh, on our soul, which we're going to identify here in just a few minutes, and then, of course, on our body. But it originates with the spirit, okay? Because this, this whole concept that's going on here. Now look at in, verse, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, Adam became a living being. But the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Okay? So the one passed on something that needed help. And the second man, because remember, we, when we look at Adam, we, we got to remember, we see it as a name, and it is a name. But it means man. That's what it means. Adam. That's what it means. Okay? And it's related to dam, which is blood, and related to red, and clay, and so on and so forth. But that's the idea here. So the first man, Adam, became a life, a life a became, I'm sorry, a living being. In other words, he became. He wasn't. Right? He had to become that. Remember, he was just formed and fashioned from the ground. And it wasn't until he was given spirit that he became a living being, right? Asuke is what it's saying here. But in the Hebrew, it's the flesh. 
So the last Adam, though, or the last man, in contrary to that, is a life-giving spirit. In the same way God breathed into the nostrils of Adam, making him a living being, the last man, of course we know who we're talking about here, the Lord Jesus Christ, breathes in us. And isn't it interesting that after the resurrection that we read where the apostles were there and Jesus breathed on them and they received his spirit. I mean, it's just really interesting when you start to get a hold of this because oftentimes people don't talk about it. They'll talk about that particular passage and just go, oh, this is kind of, with that, with, and ignoring the fact of what this means. That these guys for the ministry that he had called, they had no life in themselves to accomplish what he had asked them to do. So he breathes his life into them and they're empowered to go and to do the task that he has set before them in spite of their shortcomings, in spite of their failures, and at times unfaithfulness, they would accomplish his purpose because he had given him his, them his spirit. However, notice, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. Oh, so again, man in his natural spirit, does, or in, in, his, in the natural realm, does not have this because the one comes first, right? The, spirit, the natural is first. And then afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of the dust. There's our Genesis chapter 1, verses 27, and then into chapter 2. This is where we find this. This is that idea of God shaping and forming. Where he is of the earth, the second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so, are, so also are those who are made of dust. That's you and me. Okay? We're, we carry the, the, the likeness of Adam. Remember we touched on this. That Adam is created in the image of God. But then we read in the fifth chapter that Adam has a son created in his image. And of course now things have been marred. There's a problem now that wasn't there when Adam was created, and of course we call it the fall, there's been a separation from the God of life. And of course, bad things happen after Adam has a son in his likeness because sin has now entered into the realm of humanity. Okay? It would really get perverted, which we've talked about before, when you get to chapter 6. But this was just sheer rebellion against God, right? So as was the man of dust in verse 48 there, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, gee, I wonder who that's talking about, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, so also those are those who are heavenly. And as we have been born in the image of the man of dust, Genesis 5, we just talked about it, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. See, this, this idea of creation is carried throughout the Scripture. And, of course, we know Paul elsewhere in Corinthians tells us that if we're in Christ, then we're a what? A new creation. You see, so this, this idea of creation, everybody just thinks about it because we, we live in a day where that's challenged by, quote-unquote, evolutionary theory. I stress the word theory, okay? It's not a fact. Don't let anyone tell you it is. It's a theory because it can't be proven. There's a reason it's still called that. So anyway, um, but that's what's being described here. So we're going to bear the image of the heavenly man. Now this I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Okay, so that's death and hair. Uh, 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 anyway, you get the idea. So, so what's being described here is the concept of the spirit of man that changes things. The spirit within man is changed when it becomes, as it changes in its relationship to the spirit of God. Okay, so these things are really important for us to understand. 
So this is, and I know this is really brief on this, but we don't need to belabor the point. It's obvious. Paul made it very clear, and you can chase this down. There's multitude passages which say almost the same thing. But the idea is that we of the earth, of the dust, have a problem. We don't have the Spirit. It's got to be given to us, okay? It's a deep. Keep that in mind for where we go. But Paul, did, Paul also said not that God would sanctify them in their whole spirit. He also said in their whole soul. Now here's where we get to, in particular in our day, where there's a huge misunderstanding of this. So we're going to try to clarify this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. So, affectionately longing for you, Paul says, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Guess what the word is there? It's literally soul. We are want to impart to you because we have c- compassion for you, because we care about you. Okay, We want to give you all that we are. So that word there, we're going to see here in a minute, is the word in the Greek, it's pronounced suke. We call it psyche. That's what's being described here. So, but we, because of our concern for you and our care for you, we wanted to impart to you our very souls, okay? Because you had become dear to us, okay? So this now, you get the concept here of what's going on. Something has entered the picture that's a, that's a part of the soul, and it is affection. There's a concern. There's a caring that's here. There's a, there's a desire in the core of our being for you. We, there's, this is where it originates. So here's what the word, oops, I'm sorry, lives, I should have picked that. Um, here's the word soul. Of course, that's the Greek, don't worry about that, but that's the psyche. That's where we get it from. And of course, psychics, psychologists, psychiatrists, you get the idea. Psych. Come on, you guys. I worked on that all day. Anyway, so what is the psyche? Well, it's defined as the seat of the different affections and passions. Notice that affect, this is so important to understand here, that affections have entered the picture, such as love, hatred, anger, with sensations and appetites and propensities of different kinds. So where do these things originate? Well, depending on where we're receiving our communication from within our spirit, this is what's going to affect us. Again, this is going to play out. Don't worry about it right now. It'll make sense here in just a few minutes. Okay? So, the soul is what makes us who we are. It is our personality. When we say we know somebody, we know them for who they are. It's not about what they do. Because what they do is a revelation of who they are. Okay? That's what we're talking about here. And we're going to see this all play out here in just a few minutes. So the soul is what makes us who we are. It is our personality and was intended to be God-like in character. Okay? And there's a reason for that. We'll see that in just a second here. The soul functions within the realm of the physical, but it's influenced by the spiritual. Well, how can that be? Well, when you understand what the soul is, this is why each aspect of the soul is to be brought in line with truth received through the Spirit. So what is the soul? We just defined it, but how do we explain it? Okay? Well, the soul is also triune in its nature. It is our mind, first of all, our thinker. It's our will, our chooser. And our thirdly, it's our emotions. Ah, there's where the emotions come in. Okay? But why did Paul say he had the emotions for them? Well, because they had embraced them. So Paul had chosen, because of something that God did, and the, and the Thessalonians did, he had, he had, I'm sorry, was it, yeah, anyway, Thessalonians, yeah, um, that 
that they had gotten a hold of him. So he has feelings for them. His thought process was on them and what kind of people they were. He had chosen to be whatever it is that God had asked him to be for them. And this results in his affection for them or towards them. So the soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions. That's what the soul is. Okay? Now, you can already see what's happening here. If your mind, your will, and your emotions are not on the spirit of truth, there's going to be a problem. Because then your thinker is going to be opposite or opposed to the spirit of truth, which means that you will choose to act in opposition to him, which is going to make you feel horrible. Okay? Okay? It just does. Even for people who are not a believer. Before I became a Christian, when I used to play in the band and the whole stuff that comes along with that, okay, just, we'll just leave it at that. Nobody had to tell me that you shouldn't be doing these drugs, dude. Nobody had to tell me that. Nobody had to tell me you can't do the things that you're doing. This is not okay. I knew that, and so did everybody else that I was doing it with. We all knew. But it was, you know, we're just sowing our wild oats and, you know, whatever is it, wheat, whatever it is. You get the idea, right? You know, all you know, that stuff. Well, let me tell you something. Thank God, at, at, a, at a later point in my life, I saw this, and God brought me out of it because some of my friends didn't make it out. They didn't. And they either physically died or their lives were so messed up that they were just mush. I mean, they can't even barely function in life. So if you choose to continue to ignore that conscience, which we're going to talk about here in just a few minutes, if you and choose to ignore that, even as an unbeliever, you know what's right and wrong. Nobody has to tell you. Okay? But if you get to a point where you continue to ignore it, then you just you get hardened. Right? But this is what the soul is. Now this is going to become really, really, really important because this is the heart. Play on words there. This is the heart of the whole idea of knowing our God and understanding ourselves. Okay, so we're not going to get into the full aspect of this, but where you set your mind will have a direct effect on what you choose. It's, it's just logical. I mean, again, it ain't rocket science, man. It ain't theology. It's just common stinking sense. And then your emotions are going to be directly affected by what you set your mind on, which leads to the choices that you make, and it's going to make you feel some way until you get to a point where you no longer listen to those feelings. And that's where the conscience comes in. Okay? You can see the word there, sunedisis is how they would say it, but the conscience, and it's, there's probably, I didn't count them, but I'm guessing probably uh, 30, 30-ish direct references to this Greek word in the New Testament, and every time it's translated as conscience. It's the moral and ethical barometer. It's that part of us that God placed in us that says, this isn't right. Believer or non-believer have this. Children have this, okay? They just do. Otherwise, they wouldn't lie about what they just did, okay? They are exceptional liars, are they not? It's incredible, just incredible. This is where psychology of our day gets it wrong with this concept, which in my mind, and I think in most thinking people, is absolute absurdity that man is inherently good. To which I always want to say, do you have kids? 
because I have kids. I have grandkids. I even have great grandkids. And they are not inherently good. Okay? From the moment they're able to, they're stinking lying through their teeth. And I didn't teach them how to lie. And the moment they understand that they want something that they don't have, they're exceptional little thieves. Where does this come from? I didn't teach my kids to lie and steal. Did you? So where does this concept, man, is inherently good? If that's not checked, then what does that child be, grow up to be? A liar and a thief. All right? I mean, you, you know, hopefully there's parents in their lives that say, uh, yeah, no. Okay? How about no? Right? We're not going to allow this. Boy, I could tell you stories on this, and I would just talk about my kids because I don't want you to know stories about me. But, uh, uh, man, and it takes a while to get through this, but they are not inherently good. I didn't teach them how to lie unless Marie was doing it behind my back. And she's kind of shifty, so you never really know. Um, somehow, they were learned how to be really, really good at this. That's because it's their nature, okay? And it just is. So that's what the conscience is. The idea, and it's, it's the moral barometer. It's that sort of that, uh, that measuring device. Now, I, I don't think I have the, the verse in here. Maybe I, maybe I do, but, but Paul talks about this very thing. And, and what he's saying, you know, in a nutshell, is this very paraphrase, but if you continue to do this, then your conscience is seared. Okay? Now, what that means is it's cut and then cauterized. Okay? So it's not just that your conscience is cut. It's seared, Paul says, as with a hot iron. It no longer has the capability to do what it was intended to do. If you continue to ignore it, this is what happens. Okay? This is the ultimate result of that. 1 Peter chapter 4, Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls, and there's our word again, suke, okay, should be lives, commit their lives to him in doing good. Now we know now what suke, lives, means. Now let's read it with what we know. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their mind their will and their emotions to him in doing good. Oh, that makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? You see, God's will is for us to not only know his will, but to choose to do his will. And this is what brings us, you know, uh, you know it brings us peace inside. So we do these things in doing good as to a faithful creator. I love how he's, put, he's got creator in the same concept of what he would have said, uh, nefesh, okay? He would not have said suke because he was a Jew. So anyway, but that's what, and he ties it directly to the creation. That's, it's just amazing to me. So now again, we're just, we're just skipping here, okay? Because this stuff is really, it's very broad-based when you go through the New Testament. And, and remember, everybody always wants to look at the New Testament. But the New Testament, when Peter was using these things, there was no New Testament. When Paul was writing to the church at Thessalonica, there was no New Testament. When he was writing to Colossae last week saying that in him, Jesus, dwells the fullness of the Godhead, he wasn't reading the New Testament. But we always want to teach these principles from the New Testament, which is fine. Except we need to understand where did Paul and Peter in this case and all of the other authors of the New Testament where did, what were they basing their understanding of these things from? The Old Testament. The Tanakh to them. The entirety of God's Word. So when Peter is talking about the nefesh, 
okay, or the Greek psyche, and he's talking about it in relation to the Creator, he's not talking New Testament theology. He's basing it off of Genesis, which is where it all starts. But we do just the opposite. We want to look at the New Testament definition of it and what our doctrine says and what our theological persuasion is and filter it through that instead of going back and understanding what it meant when God first used these words. And all the while, in our Western doctrine, in our Western theology, we talk about how important it is in the principle of hermeneutics, inductive Bible study, to study the words and to understand them in their original context. But how often have we heard, and I'm guilty of this as anybody else, I'm not pointing any fingers here, done the same thing, of just trying to understand these principles from a New Testament thing. When the original of it is, look, if you want to understand salvation, you don't read Paul in Romans chapter 3. Even what Jesus said in John chapter 3. You want to understand salvation, where do you understand it from? The Old Testament. You want to understand sanctification, Paul again in Romans. Where did Paul come? The dude was a rabbi, you guys. When he's teaching this stuff, what is he teaching? The Old Testament. But we don't go back there. And in our hermeneutics, we talk about the law of first mention. But seldom do we go back and find out the first mention and develop the doctrine from that point of reference. Because that's how it develops. We, have, we do this and then go this way. And that's why there's the confusion that there is. It's just sad. So that, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their mind, their will, and their emotions to Him in doing good. The totality of who they are as to a faithful creator. Okay? And there's our word. Okay, this is that verse I was talking about. I, I couldn't remember if I put it in there. I thought I did. This is Paul writing to, to Timothy, all right? Young Timothy, who's going to end up pastoring a church. And Paul is talking about this very thing. He's talking about those who stand opposed to the teaching of God's Word. Look, they, they're speaking lies and hypocrisy. And here's that passage. Having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. So that means cut and cauterized, Okay? There's a way that they do this today for, to stop men from having little babies. You get the idea, the big V word. What is that? A cutting and a cauterizing. Kind of a weird example, but it's one that I think we're all familiar with. You get the idea. That's what happens if you continue to disregard the truth that you know to be out there in your mind and you choose to live opposed to that, feeling miserable all of the time, because we all know that though we say it's fun to do these things, there's ultimately major prices to be paid for them. And if you continue to go that route, that part of you that says, got to stop this, got to change this, eventually gets cut off and it gets seared and then you're like a boat without an oar. No, rudder, there we go boat without a rudder, okay? You're just drifting at that point. Where do you think all of the addictions that we have? And wait till we get into this later because we are going to be talking about this stuff. That's why I put this study together so long ago, dealing with these kind of situations in people's lives. How, does, how do we do addiction to whatever it is? It doesn't matter. You know, fill in the blank, addicted to whatever, right? How does that happen? Well, if you continue to give yourself over to these things in your mind, your will, and emotions, then it directly affects your body. And your body is ultimately going to get control of you, right? What are these people, with these, 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 you know, addicts, what are they? They have to have, what is it that has to have it? It's the body. If the body doesn't get it, the body act, reacts adversely. And they hate themselves for putting themselves in this position. Make no mistake about it. I've never seen an addict, maybe you know, one, I've never seen an addict of anything that's thrilled to be an addict. All of them hate what they are, hate what they do. 
And they could see the trajectory of their life that got them to that point. But it's really tough to get out of there. Because if you give the body control, it's not going to turn out that well. It's just not. So speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own moral compass, conscience, seared as with a hot iron. Okay? Now the body, the baudet. Just in case you didn't catch that, that's French. <laughs> no, if it was French, it'd be le baudet. <laughs> I guess I don't know. <laughs> I don't have a clue. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, anyways. Okay, body. That's the Greek word soma. That's how you would say that. It's an organized system formed, notice formed, not created, formed by the creative, by the creative energy of God out of the dust of the earth. Okay, we've already touched on this. God took the physical, the dirt that was already there, and used that dirt to form and to fashion man. And then once man is fashioned and has the capacity to see, hear, taste, touch, and smell, I think it was the five, um, once it has that capacity, God breathes into its nostrils, into this body, and it becomes a round. It becomes a man. Okay? So that's the idea of the body, that, that it's directly connected to that which it was formed from, from the earth. Okay? That's what's being described. And because of sin, what does God say? Right? Dust you were created, to dust you're going to return. What happens when we die? Okay, well, we turn into little piles of dust. In my case, big fat piles of dust. But you get the idea. We turn into dust. That's what happens. Exactly what God said. Oh, the, the evolution is, well, that's just the process. Yeah, well, yeah. Sorry. Okay, anyway. So, the body, we'll call it the earth suit. Again, I didn't come up with this clever little title. This was Bill Gillum. Uh, Bill and Annabelle Gillum, I love those guys, and they're, they're teaching on some of this stuff, which is where I really kind of stole a lot of this. Um, but uh, he calls it the earth suit, okay? The part that carries us around in this earth. The earth suit is that part of us made from the earth to function within the earth, okay? That's why God gave us a body. Angels do not have bodies, physical bodies, though apparently they're able to, you know, do things that we're not able to do because they weren't created for the physical. They were created for the spiritual. Which makes it all the more interesting when Jude says those that left that the first place that God had placed them, they decided to leave that and to embrace the physical. Aye. Okay, so, but that's who we are. We're created from the earth to function within the earth. Now remember, prior to the fall, what was man's function to be? He was to be the image of likeness of God who has dominion over all things, man was given dominion of what? The earth. Of all that was physical. And would have maintained that, and, and you can not, not say we kind of still do, but, but had the, the right, the authority to rule the physical. That's by God's choice. Angels were never given that. They were to help man as he ruled in the physical, Psalm 82, they were to help, but they were never given dominion, which is part of the reason why one of them, named Lucifer, said, well, I'm going to be like God, and we all you get the idea. It just goes on and on from there, okay? This is the purpose of God's design of the senses, okay? We get our term sensual from it. This is what it means to be of the senses, Taste, touch, sight, smell, and hearing. This is what our bodies are equipped with or were intended to be equipped with so that we could function within the physical realm. But we live in a fallen world. So man in Adam's image, as Paul already told us, dust producing dust, People into this world who can't see, who don't have the ability to touch, who don't have the ability to taste or to smell 
or to hear. Those are results of man turning his back on his creator. And that separation that exists because of that, God puts him outside the garden. There's a, there's a breakdown in the communication with God because there's a separation from God. And the rest, as they say, is history. I mean, world history, uh, the history of man is not very good at any point. It's just amazing. So, in fact, the word when you read in your scriptures, uh, in your, depending on what translation, you'll see the word, English word, sometimes carnal. Sometimes you'll see flesh, okay? Um, but it's translating, those are English words translating the Greek sarkikos, okay? Sarkikos means of or in the manner of the flesh or the material, so when Paul is speaking about the fight or the struggle that we have with the flesh, when Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, what both of them are saying is all that you are in relation to the realm that you function in, okay, uh, that's where the strength is. The flesh, the senses. Again, why do people have addictions. Well, this all that explains it. Why do Christians still find themselves in a problem? Well, because you're, you're, you're allowing your senses to rule you. Right? You know how difficult it is even for believers? You Guys coming in here all the time and they're losing their families because of pornography. I say, look, you wanna, do you want to stop at the pornography thing? Well, yeah, I really want... Okay, well then, you know, do you have a computer at home? Yep. Then throw it away. Well, I can't do that. Well, I thought you said you wanted to get rid of this. You see, we're not going to pray about this and you're going to get better. I'm not going to give you a study from anybody. I'm not going to tell you to watch any videos online. Because if you don't stop going to that computer or your phone, then we, I can't help you. You've got to choose. Notice what's just into the picture. In your mind, I'm giving you the truth. You must choose to make the decision. Get rid of the computer. Oh, I can't live without a computer. Well, then I can't help you. So when you do lose your family, you know, it's, it's going to be heartbreaking. But you've got to choose to do this. Even if you don't feel like it. That's the third part of the soul. This is how it works. It isn't prayer. It isn't all these other things. Those things are certainly helpful. I'm not in any way saying they're not. I'm saying if this person put in alcohol, put in whatever you want. I don't care what it is. Put in anything you want. If you're not willing to do this, then you're not going anywhere from this point. It just isn't. It's not going to happen. It's got to start. You've got to get control of that which you see, taste, touch, smell, and hear. You've got to. If you don't, what you taste, touch, see, hear, and smell will control you. It will control you. My smell absolutely controls me. If I walk by a donut shop, it takes every ounce of strength that I have to not go and invade that place. Now, you get the idea. Look, this, this is just the reality. This is simple stuff. It's in God's Word, and it's as simple as I'm identifying it here. And there are people who have <laughs> degrees from, you know, multiple years of college and are still paying off student loans when all they had to do was read God's Word. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people, and they've said, wow, well, that makes total sense. I spent all this time in counseling with these people and paying all of these people, and what you just said is exactly what I have to do. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to do it. It's like, yeah, and they're going, well, why did I pay that other person? Good question. I don't know. It's amazing how God's Word answers, right? It's given so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Does it mean what it says or doesn't it? It says or doesn't it? I want to have a degree. But even in the church now, you got to have a degree, right? 
Can't, I can't, I'm not allowed to even, in our, sort of in our government, and this has been years, not even allowed to talk about counseling anymore. As elders, we can't counsel. We have to give spiritual advice. Okay. Because if we put the word counsel in there, and this person shoots themselves, if we're trying to keep them from shooting themselves, then guess what? They come back on us. Oh, you said you were a counselor. Yeah, well, because in our, their minds, you're qualified. No, no, I have the Word of God. I don't need a thing hanging on my wall with piled higher and deeper on it, right? PhD. <laughs> I don't need that. I have God's Word. If that's not sufficient for you, then by all means, hire a psychiatrist. I mean, it, just, it is what it is. But it's really kind of simple when you look at God's Word. It's amazing how the world survived until Freud <laughs> without psychology. Amazing. What an amazing thing, right? But that's what the flesh means. It's the concept of senses. Because if, the, if you allow the flesh, the senses, to dictate what you think, what you choose, and what you feel, you're in huge amounts of trouble. And it is tough to get out of it. Okay? It is the means by which we are to interact with God and with others. If I have God's Spirit in me and I'm in communication in a relationship with God's Spirit like Paul said, then my thought process will be, as Paul said elsewhere, let your mind be set on things above. You're going to hear all these verses again. That's what he's talking about, right? Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing. And he goes through all of this stuff. What's the struggle there? He's saying, look, this is what you have to do. So if I... God's Spirit says this, and I know what His Spirit is communicating to me as truth. Now my mind has entered into the picture. Now I have to make a choice. My will enters the picture. Am I going to follow the truth as revealed by God in my life, or am I going to disregard it? Okay? In spite of how it makes me feel. Because sometimes the will of God doesn't feel that great. Okay? It just doesn't. And then on an emotional side as we understand it. But there is great contentment in knowing that you are doing what God has asked you to do. You're where God wants you to be. And even if it's uncomfortable for you, you can embrace it little story on this. When, we, when God sent Marie and I to Belize with Nikki and Krista, they were still young enough, but Rick and Scott were out uh, in, uh, in school. And uh, I had a really, really hard time the first six months. I was devastated being away from my boys. Now I can't wait for them to leave. But in those days, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but it was a total struggle for me. And I, I, even though we, 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 you know, they were going their own route, it was just, there was something about it. I'm in, I'm in the rainforest, for goodness sake, and my kids aren't here, and it was hard for me. She'll, she can attest to this. And I would literally, at nights, I would just weep. And I felt, it felt like God was, I had done something wrong, and God is punishing me. Bad Rick. Police it is for you. Right? Because that's the view oftentimes. I mean, I was a pastor, for goodness sake. But that's the view that I took. That I had to go to Belize for, you know, you know from, it was my purgatory, I guess. And I struggled with this. It was, and I, because I knew it was absolute nonsense. I'm where God wants me to be. And when I wasn't in these, this emotional turmoil, I got that. I understood it, but it was a total struggle for me for the first few months. And, uh, and it just really, and then this, we got, I had to come back to the States, to Waco, Texas, right, for a big board meeting. And I won't bore you with all of the details. And after this meeting in uh, Texas, uh, we, it was, you know, we were there three or four days, whatever it was. And I so missed home. 
And I remember distinctly going, I'm so ready to go home. And I went, all of a sudden, Belize had become home. And, and it, everything changed from that moment. And guess what, you guys? This is going to be hard for you to hear, but Belize is still home for Marie and I. It still is. We love Mesquite. Make no mistake about it. But that place, what God did in us in that place, and I've shared this with some of you in the past, whenever we fly into the country and you're looking out at that rainforest, it's just like we're coming home. I know it's bizarre. I get it. Okay? I know I told you I did drugs in the past. It's not that. <laughs> It's bizarre, but it's just a look out the window and you see the trees and the rivers and we just get all giddy. And then the airplane lands. Of course, it's a little tiny airport. So you land these big airplanes. You got to get off and walk up to. And the minute that door opens and you hit those steps, you know, because you got to walk down to the tarmac and you walk out there and all of a sudden this heat and this humidity hits you upside the head like somebody's waiting there with a baseball bat. Boom! And it's just like, whoa. And the smell of, you know, of, you know, the smells that come with, with rainforest, it smells. Uh, but it's just like, yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. I know, but that's what I'm talking about, okay? So, so this, this whole idea of the emotions and stuff, and this, how this all plays out in my mind, my will, and my emotions, and in yours, is recognized with the people around us because who we are on the inside is what people see, right? That's why you heard me you know, all the time I was saying, please stop telling me about your faith. Ooh, I don't want to hear about your stinking faith. If you have faith, it will be evident in everything you do and everything you say because the physical will follow what's happening in the mind, the will, and the emotions because it's in line with the truth as delivered from God's word. We need to stop talking about our faith and start living our faith, okay? Uh, okay, so here we are. This, and then I'll close with this. So the lamp of the body is the eye. Now, we looked at this. We don't have time to really develop this. Remember what Jesus is talking about here because though he's using this concept of the body, this, what he's talking about here is exactly what we're communicating because what's being described here is... In, as they understood it, and as we should understand it, because like I said, we need to understand how they perceived it, this has to do with being a miser, not giving anything to somebody, or being generous. That's what's being described here. We always look at it as a lamp and light and sin, and if that's not what he's talking Look at the context. The context is treasures and so on and so forth. It is not sin. So what was happening here is that there were people who had been given something by God and they were hoarding it to themselves. That's what it means to a Jew to this day to have an evil eye. To have an evil eye means that you're not going to share what you have with anyone. To have a good eye means that you're completely open and giving. So make sure that you understand that. So the lamp of the body is the eye, okay? If therefore your eye is good, right? If you're a giver, if you're willing to give out, then who you are, your body, it will be evident because it will be full of light. Oh, there we did it again. Jumped back. Okay? Um, your whole body. So in other words, what you are on the inside will be evident on the outside. So the body has no, it, it doesn't do anything. Again, it's not my body that's communicating with you. It's my mind, my will, and emotions communicating things to you and using my body to flap my jobs and the jaws and move my tongue around so you can hear it. If you take that away... This thing is no good, okay? Think of a person with a stroke. Nothing wrong with them in the physical realm, but there's been a problem in the mental realm. There's a complete breakdown 
between the mind and the body. They're not connecting. There's a disconnect. On the other hand, if your eye is bad, right? If you're a miser, if you're self-centered, okay, then your whole body, your actions, everything you do will be full of darkness. If therefore the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? If this is what you really are, it's going to be evident wherever you go. Okay? And then Romans 6.6, 6, knowing this, that our old man, okay, that's that part of us that fights, knowing this, <clears throat> excuse me, that our old man was crucified with him, that why? The body of sin, that part of us that fights against the mind, the will, and the emotions. Because it's senses. It wants what this world has to offer. So we were crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. So the idea of the body being hooked into these things is equated to slavery. What's a modern term? Addiction. That's what it is. Again, we're back to this whole concept. I think that's it. Yep. So, so us in God's image, we are triune. We have a spirit, that part of us that is in connection with God. We're going to see next week there's a problem, which we saw in the first part of this. Because of sin, there was a separation from God to his life, and man is put outside the garden. Man becomes spiritually what? Dead. He's lost the ability to communicate with his God. Whereas he walked in the garden, now sacrifices have to be made. Now all of these other things have to be done because that relationship has been severed. Um, so so we'll, we'll see that next week. But us in God's image, we have that spirit in us that God has made alive. This is the born again experience. We're going to look at that. That when that happens now, we now have communication with God, which we didn't have prior to that. Jesus is going to tell a fellow by the name of Nicodemus those exact words. And when we have that, then obviously our minds understand it. But then we have to choose what to do with it. And we've got to keep our feelings in check, our emotions. Because whatever we choose to do with our mind and our will as revealed by God will be evident in what we do in the body. Which, by the way, is triune in its nature as well. Flesh, bone, blood. Okay? Just, you know, it, it's, it's amazing how, you know, in the image of God means a lot more than just the image of God. So you... So, so the idea, that's man in God's image. That's who we really are. Now next week we're going to look at how that became a problem and what God did about it. We've already touched on this, as I said we would, in the first part. And then we're going to conclude with looking at how this comes into play in the life of the believer. Because Paul clearly identifies the contrast between a believer and a what? Carnal believer. That ought to tell you something now with what we've seen. What is a carnal believer? It's a believer who is ruled by their senses. It's called sin. So there you have it. So next week we'll develop this a little bit more. And, uh, uh, and, and like I said last week, uh, I hope that this does what it normally does this study is kind of makes you go, oh, wow, this, this you know, this really helps, especially if you're dealing with somebody else in your life, a family member, a friend or something. This helps you to understand where all of this stuff is coming in, coming from. I'm sorry. And, and it just gives you a more, you know, a, a more fixed way to minister to these people. And yeah, you're called to ministry just like I am. Okay, you, to minister to one another, you're to minister to those who don't know him, you know. Well, we think, oh, the minister, that's the minister's job. No, no, that's your job, okay? Christ lives in you, so you need to minister to those he brings into your life. 
Problem with that is we end up, what do we do? Argue with them, right? To make our point. And it's pointless. You're not going to change their mind. That has to be, God. that's God's job, not yours. You just present the truth. Oh, there it is. Then they have to choose what to do with that truth. And it will affect how they feel and it will be evident in how their life is lived. See? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for your word, just the simplicity of this. Knowing our God, really knowing who you are will help us to understand who we are. It's been here for thousands and thousands of years, Lord. All of it. All the truth we ever needed. All of the counseling tools that we've ever needed are found in the pages of this incredible book that we call the Bible. If we would just get a hold of it and touch and trust it, not someone's comment on it or someone's opinion of it or someone's interpretation of it. It's your word. Everything else is irrelevant. So thank you for being here with us this evening, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.